and cut on that. Bunny! Yes! I don't know what that noise was. I think it was my bottle. I think it was my bottle. Um, if you're like me, you're no doubt a big fan of this podcast, The Pope on Film. I mean, who is it nowadays at this day and age? But only real fans, true hardcore fans who have been with us since the beginning would know two things about us. Two undeniable, really real, and in no way made up on the spot facts about the both of us, America's hottest podcasting couple, Bunny and Steve. First and foremost, Bunny, the first fact, which is about you, is the fact that in your spare time, you are a pioneer in the new field of fish choreography. So can you just take some time to explain to the audience what that is? When I was very young, I had observed my goldfish swimming back and forth in its little bowl to the rhythm of Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. And I had been become fascinated ever since uh, and have, have had many, many fish. Uh, and have been working on this for decades and decades. Yeah. And I, I have learned how I can train fish of any species. Okay. Oh, nice. How I could train fish to swim in synchronized patterns to various forms of music. Well, I say various forms of music, anything but death metal. Too many fish die oh. trying to swim in synchronicity to death metal songs. Sorry, guys. Yeah. Love the makeup, but... Very sad, yeah. I, yeah. I you know... Being a film buff, I can't help but, like, I really lean towards Busby Berkeley-type productions. Um, and it's, it's, it's even more, more akin to painting, because you could use different colored fish swimming in different colored patterns, you know. That sounds beautiful. Sharks are really good for taking up space. But not too much space, you know? Dolphins yeah. are great background players, okay? Uh, dolphins really can't ever carry a show because they're always backstage hitting on the puffer fish. So, oh, oh, yeah. But in the background, they are awesome, you know? Yeah. Uh, it sounds like a real burgeoning field. And I'm it, proud it of is. you. I'm proud of you for being at the forefront. You know? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's a big deal. And the second fact that you would know about me is that I'm a lover of history. I love it, but I'm also a storyteller. So what I like to do here at this juncture, I'm holding a chicken. <laughs> okay. What I like to do at this juncture is I like to get a story... Uh, I like to get a story from the history books, maybe one that people don't know too well, and reword it via my own unique storytelling style, and that's what this is. Another educationally uneducational installment of Steve's Historic Approximation! Dun, 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 dun. Or Shap, as I like to call it, repeatedly, annoyingly, whether anyone wants me to or not, personally, I like the name Shap. It's entertaining yet educational. It's the school, it's like if Schoolhouse Rock got stoned. Yes. Anyway, this week on the old Shappity Shap Shap, I will be finishing our first ever Shapology. Yes. A trilogy of interconnected Shaps. Two weeks ago, we discussed how actor Norman Fell was kicked off of the wildly successful TV show Three's Company to star in a spinoff called The Ropers that was canceled. The screwing of Norman Fell. Great chap. I'm really proud of that. 
Then last week, we discussed the rise and fall of TV executive Fred Silverman and the hilariously disastrous 1979 TV midseason, which is what led to the Ropers being canceled in the first place. And finally, this week, we wrap up the Shapology with a look at what is probably the biggest thing that Fred Silverman is known for. And to fully understand it, we need to discuss the early years of Saturday Night Live! Okay. So here's a quick version for you. Johnny Carson owned late night Saturdays on TV because Monday through Friday, the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson was the biggest thing. It was so big that on Saturday nights, they would run reruns, the the Tonight Show, the best of Carson. Uh, Carson's comedy classics is what I grew up with. They were like uh, like syndicated best of clips of yeah. Johnny Carson, and they would run on UHF. And it would always be late at night, so I would stay up as a kid so I could watch Carson's comedy classics on TV. So uh, in 1974, the all-powerful Carson demanded more time off and realized that if he wanted a weekday off, he could just air a best of. So he pulled the best of Carson from Saturday nights, and now NBC has a hole that needs filling, desperately needs a new Saturday night show. So the head of late night programming, a man named Penis <coughs> Everswole. Okay. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. Dick Ebersol. I was really close, though. <laughs> yes. I was really close with Penis Everswole. So Dick Ebersol, he goes I, I just to... thought he was Norwegian. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. Nice. So Dick Ebersol goes to crazed Canadian Lord Michaels, and he says, live variety show, and the suits don't like the idea, but also they're desperate as fuck. So NBC Saturday Night premieres in 1975. It instantly becomes the cool hip show, and Lord Michaels and the cast are stars. Cut two. It's 1979. It's been almost five years, and Lorne Michaels is struggling to hold shit together. Chevy Chase is gone. Dan Aykroyd is gone. John Belushi just left, and there's two Murrays on the show. And that's <laughs> fascinating to me, because I remember Bill Murray being on the show, but not one of the Murray brothers also being on the show, and that's fucking weird. Brian uh, Doyle? Yeah, Brian yeah. Doyle Murray. Uh, Paul Schaefer, the musician, is now bumped to official cast member, along with writer Al Franken. And Harry Shearer is a cast member, too? It's a crazy season. You gotta kind of feel a little sorry for Brian Doyle Murray, though. Because, oh, yeah. like, like, what? Yeah. Because, like, yeah. Wherever, wherever he wound, because he was already a face in things before Bill yeah. Murray ever showed up. You know? Yeah. So like and then Bill and then Bill Murray just shows up and steals all the thunder. Yeah, and then it, oh, then yeah. suddenly it's like like it, see it kind of reminds me of like you and your brother, okay? Like you're yeah. Brian Doyle Murray and you get this kind of little comedy thing going for yourself, and you're making appearances on shit, and, you know. And then Jose shows up. And he's like, oh, that looks like fun. I'm going to do that same thing. And just, like, takes it away from you now. He's all fucking famous, and it looks like you're riding his coattails. You know? I am I am So I feel sorry my, for Brian Doyle Murray. Yeah. I am surprised that my brother hasn't started a podcast. Yeah. That's my next that's my next uh prediction that my brother is going to be like I, any, anybody can start a podcast. I'm gonna start a podcast. I'm gonna talk about I don't know, fucking the Howard Stern. <laughs> so yeah, so 1979 to 1980, the fifth season of Saturday Night Live. It's a it's an interesting one, especially because 
a lot of people think, oh, the first five years of Saturday Night Live, that was just the original cast. And then, boom, it's the 80s. But it's just not true. Uh, the show is changing. People are getting really burned out. And no one more so than Lauren Michaels. And so it's near the end of season five. SNL, as it is now known, is a definite success with its cast members becoming stars, making movies, but it's all getting difficult at this point. Uh, it's all getting difficult to keep together. Also, at this point in time, pretty much, cocaine has been promoted to a featured player. Yes. Basically. And as the idea of a sixth season gets closer, the big question is, will Lord Michaels renew his contract? Because Gilda Radner, Jane Curtin, Garrett Morris, Bill Murray, they all basically said that we will happy, happily come back to season six if and only if Lorne Michaels comes back. So it's very important to the future of the show that someone work with Lorne Michaels to get him back on the show. Hopefully a negotiations master, someone who has a calm, level head, someone uh, who can take the time and the energy to work with Lorne Michaels and to renew his contract. Unfortunately, the person whose job it is to renew Lawrence Michaels' contract is the one and only Fred Silverman. Yes. So he helped CBS beat a. I'm kind of, I'm kind of feeling, a, a, I'm kind of feeling that like horses should whinny in the background every time you say his name now. Yeah, yeah, that's really good. So like, here's oh! a really. Here's a really quick version of last week's uh, shab. Fred Silverman helped CBS beat ABC in the ratings, and, and, and he beat ABC so bad that ABC then hired Fred Silverman and helped ABC beat CBS, and then RTV Icarus thought that, oh, I've saved one network. I've saved two networks. What, NBC? You're in last place? Well, I can easily save you, too. So, when it was... But, spoiler alert, he absolutely could not and almost bankrupted NBC. The entire network almost went out of business due to Fred Silverman uh, not doing a good job. Yeah. So, when it was time to renew Lorne Michaels' contract, <clears throat> it's the end of 1979, it's the beginning of the 1980s, Fred Silverman was turning a sinking ship into a sinking ship on fire. Yes. And there's also a bomb on the ship. So Fred Silverman was... He knew he had to renew Lorne Michaels' contract, but he was also busy yelling and screaming and throwing shit in his office at unpaid interns and subordinates. Okay. That took up a good deal of his time. And it's like, I know I need to help Lorne Michaels, but also, if if I spend so much time and effort uh, getting Lorne Michaels to renew his contract, who's going to yell at the coffee boy? Yeah. So, uh, at the contract negotiations, Fred Silverman, he doesn't even show up. He's like, I'm too busy, I can't show up. And, and so Fred Silverman's, like, uh, subordinates show up, and they start berating Lorne Michaels. Uh, oh, Lorne Michaels, I guess it's time to renew your contract. Oh, look, it's the SNL guy. Hey, remember how you made us buy the rights to Gilda Radner's Broadway show and it ended up bombing? So what, Lorne Michaels? Are you here to screw us again? Okay. That last bit is a quote from an NBC executive who literally said to Lorne Michaels, so, are you here to fucking screw us again? Wow. Lorne Michaels felt disrespected, and rightfully so. There is yelling and screaming, and Lorne Michaels storms out of the meeting, convinced that his time at NBC is up. He is disgusted with how the NBC studio execs have absolutely disrespected him after turning a hole in late-night programming into the coolest, hippest show on television. 
Lorne Michaels is pissed, and this story starts working its way around backstage until it reaches the ears of cast member and future Minnesota Senator Mr. Al Franken. Yes. His name rose in SNL as the original cast slowly disappeared, and everyone assumed, rightly so, rightfully so, that if Lorne Michaels, heaven forbid, is going to leave, then the person who will replace him is Al Franken, replacing Lorne Michaels as the future producer of Saturday Night Live. Al Franken was so certain of his place on the throne that he began a very well-received series of monologues, regular monologues on Weekend Update, announcing that the 1980s would be, as he put it, the Al Franken decade. Yes. And his whole bit in the monologues would be he would keep saying his name over and over again. Hello, thank you for having me on the show. Me, Al Franken. Which I found that, I found that pretty amusing. I like that idea. I enjoyed that ten years. Thank you, Al, for and milking week, that going fucking be... for like a record time. But other than that, previously, yeah. like, like I never thought Al Franken was funny. As a kid, I always hated when Franken and Davis would show up. Yeah, I hated. And Franken it was like, oh, Davis. I love this. I love this rerun of SNL. This is really cool. And oh shit, it's a Franken and Davis bit. Okay, maybe maybe something else is on. So I was never that big. So Fred Silverman is in charge of NBC. He's flailing wildly at resurrecting NBC. He almost bankrupts the whole network, and now he's ignoring Lorne Michaels' contract negotiations. Al Franken hears this, and he decides to respond. Okay. Now, before this now infamous moment in Saturday Night Live history, SNL had made fun of Fred Silverman before. John Belushi played Fred Silverman a number of times in a handful of skits. It got laughs, and Fred Silverman liked them. But it needs to be said that Fred Silverman's lackeys would always make sure that he saw a copy of the script making fun of them before they ever got on the air. Okay. He would never ask (coughs) for changes. He just wanted to know when SNL was going to make fun of it. And he would read the scripts in advance, and then there you go. Uh, But overall, Fred Silverman didn't mind being lightly made fun of on Saturday Night Live. He considered it an honor. But Al Franken was pissed as fuck that NBC and Fred Silverman in particular were shitting on Lorne Michaels. So it's the next to last episode of the fifth season of Saturday Night Live. So this also sounds to me like, like this is also where Saturday Night Live kind of loses its edge as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I can absolutely... Part of the fun of the original Saturday Night Live was... was, It was dangerous. You know? It was live. It looked really rough as shit. You know? Like the sets might fall down at any time. Uh... and you knew that they were all on something, and it's yep. an ensemble Absolutely. of illicit drugs, and anything could happen. It was exciting for that, you know. Yeah. What the fuck? So, and this sounds like where it really kind of lost that. No, you can absolutely one hundred percent. Um hear this story and say, oh, this is the exact moment that the original cast of SNL ended. Yeah. So, it's the next to next to last episode of the fifth season. It's not the next to last, but it's the next to next to last episode of the fifth season. Bob Newhart is hosting, and this is something for all of you young people, um, 
back in the 70s, people loved hearing a nerdy bald guy awkwardly stutter. Hence, New Heart Mania. Yeah. Because that was his whole thing. Al Franken writes an intense, personal, fierce monologue for Weekend Update that he calls a limo for a lame Okay. In his monologue, Al Franken tells a story about how he had a great idea for a skit while leaving 30 Rockefeller Plaza, and while he's trying, and he's trying to catch a taxi, but a fan stops Al Franken and starts pestering him, and then boom, he forgets the idea. Why? Because Al Franken does not get a limo. But then Al Franken starts going into, you know who does get a limo? NBC star Gary Coleman and NBC president Fred Silverman and Al Franken launches into an attack on Fred Silverman even going so far as to pull up a chart of the top 10 TV shows on network television and says uh, about the network's top 10 now I see some A's here some B's, some C's even an S you know what I don't see? I don't see any ends. He then personally attacks Fred Silverman. He calls him a total failure. He says, quote, you, this guy has been here two years. You lost me with the letters. <laughs> oh, because uh, here's all of the top ten shows and then the networks that they're on. And it's like, well, I see some C's here, some A's, some B's, some S's. You know what I don't see? I don't see any ends, because NBC did not have a top ten oh, show okay. on television. So then he starts attacking Fred Silverman. He calls him a total failure. He calls him a lame-o. He says the guy's been here two years and he hasn't done diddly squat. He calls him a timid, indecisive, easily pressured man. He's weak. Wow. And it's a real below-the-belt attack. It's savage and it ends with a contest. He says Al, I, Al Franken, should deserve a limo and I dare say I deserve a limo more than the lame Fred Silverman. So he gives the address to Fred Silverman's office and he tells viewers to send postcards to Fred Silverman's office demanding that Al Franken get a limo. Okay. <laughs> so it, so this is the monologue that that Al Franken writes, uh, and at dress rehearsal it kills. It's super funny. Everyone thinks it's hilarious, and that is when Fred Silverman's subordinates see the monologue at dress rehearsal, and they go, "Oh shit, this is a really nasty attack." Fred Silverman's not going to like this. We need to show him the script beforehand. But here's the problem. It's a Saturday. Fred Silverman is at home with his wife, with his kids. And now you mean to tell me that some gopher, some unpaid intern, some freaking lackey has to risk their life by calling Mr. Throw shit around the office? Yeah. Call him at home on his day off and read to Fred Silverman on the phone a savage personal attack. Fuck no. <laughs> so Fred Silverman isn't notified beforehand of Al Franken's monologue. The episode goes live. Fred Silverman sees the limo for a lame-o skit. And... um. And Fred Silverman just goes ape shit. He goes absolutely ape shit. He starts losing it. Fred Silverman assumes that Lorne Michaels deliberately allowed Al Franken to attack him. That is not true. The truth of the matter was Lorne Michaels said, well, this monologue will infuriate Fred Silverman, but you know what I like about the monologue? The show is five minutes short. And the monologue's five minutes. I'm leaving the monologue in. Yeah. So, uh, Lorne Mike... So... But Fred Silverman has had enough, and, and he is done 
with Lorne Michaels with contract negotiations. He doesn't want to talk to any of them. So now Lorne Michaels is like, okay, this is it. This is the last straw. I'm burned out. Fred Silverman, piece of shit. I'm officially leaving SNL. But the network wants it to continue. So Lorne Michaels says, well, if I'm gone, a writer will have to take over because they understand the show. And Fred Silverman is like, oh, so you want a writer to be in charge of uh, SNL when you're gone? You mean Al Franken? That son of a bitch is gone. <laughs> yeah. There is no way I'm letting Al Franken be the producer of Saturday Night Live. So Fred Silverman personally hires associate producer Gene Dumanian to head SNL instead of Al, Al Franken. And so the fall of SNL, with SNL's sixth season and the now infamous Saturday Night Live 80 with Charlie Rocket and uh, Denny Dillon and Gilbert Godfrey, the season that was I so bad... I still have PTSD over that shit. Yeah, the season that was so bad that at NBC almost canceled it. That all happened because Fred Silverman was made fun of on Saturday Night Live. Fred Silverman but, but himself like not just, but almost see, killed Saturday Night Live. Not only was it like, what the fuck, who are these people? But it it almost kind of like... Charlie Rocket bears a resemblance to Chevy Chase. Not a lot. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Almost, almost like they tried to fool us. Like... Oh no, this is the cast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe it, they it, won't it, know it. this. <laughs> and I feel that at the time, Gilbert Godfrey did have an Al Franken look about him. He had that, like, big sort of fro of yeah. hair. So, 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 uh, so, yeah, Fred Silverman, not only did he almost bankrupt the entirety of NBC, but he also uh, led to Saturday Night Live almost getting canceled. It's all Fred Silverman's fault. So here's what happened after a limo for a lame Fred Silverman was basically given a vote of no confidence by the board at NBC. They didn't trust him anymore. They didn't think he did a good job. So Fred Silverman quit in 1981. And you might think, oh, well, that's the end of Fred Silverman. No! Fred Silverman started the Fred Silverman Company and started creating TV shows to either sell to a major network or to sell off to syndication. And he personally helped create the TV shows Matlock, Jake and the Fat Man, In the Heat of the Night, The Father Dowling Mysteries, Diagnosis Murder, and more. Wow. So, like, all of those shows in the 80s and 90s that were in syndication forever that, like, your mom or grandmother liked to watch, yeah, that was all Fred Silverman. So, so he landed on his feet, and, and, and good for him. But also, you screwed Norman Fell and almost killed Saturday Night Live. So, good for you, Fred Silverman. And also, fuck you. <laughs> yes. But that is the end of our Shapology. Of three interconnected shafts. This closes the curtain on Fred Silverman and yes, his it life. Does. He has he has died of cancer, and it's very sad. But man, what an insane career! The things he helped create. He helped create Scooby Doo. He helped create uh, Laverne and Shirley, Mork and Mindy, Three's Company. The list goes on and on. You know? Yeah. It, it, it's fascinating. His entire career is just... There's a million other stories that I didn't say for time, you know? Oh, I but, would imagine. Yeah. But, man, what a life. What a life this guy had. And that's it for Shap this week. What's coming up next week, I'm not sure. But whatever it is, it's going to be good. So join us next week for more up-to-date... Uh, 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 no, that's... what. what what's my outro? Join us next week for more educationally uneducational fun with Steve's Historic Approximation! And cut on that.